Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. I started talking to you last night about anger and we started in Ephesians 4 that says when you're angry do not sin don't ever let the sun go down on your anger so it doesn't say that if you get angry when you get angry we all experience anger at different times in our life the feeling of anger is not a sin it's what we do with that anger that can become a sin you don't want to repress it you don't want to express it wrongly we need to control ourselves that's why God has given us self-control I want to encourage you to teach your children properly about anger don't make them think that every time they get angry that they're doing something wrong but teach them to control their anger and not get violent and do things that don't make any sense if you want your children to not be angry children then you need to not be an angry parent because if they're living in a house full of anger, they're going to pick up your habits. That's exactly what I did from my father. And so we started learning last night how to fight like a Christian. When somebody mistreats us or abuses us, the answer to it is not to try to get them back. It's not to return evil for evil, but it's to trust God and do good. Put our trust in God. God, you're our vindicator. I trust you to deal in the proper way with people who have mistreated me, and I'm going to continue to do good. I'm not going to turn away from my God-given assignment to deal with all the mean people in the world. I'm going to stay focused on what God has called me to do. I'm going to keep helping people, and when I help people, I'm sowing a seed then for my breakthrough in life. We can easily understand, let's just say that there's 100 people called to do different things in the kingdom, to help the poor, to be missionaries, preach the gospel, worship leaders, whatever. So let's just say a hundred little demons are sent out from hell every day, one assigned to each one of those called, anointed Christians. And all that demon's job is, is to set them up to get them upset, to offend them, to put people in their way that will uh, mistreat them, to hurt them. And so if these hundred Christians don't understand what I'm talking about today or what God teaches in his word, then they're going to spend all their time fighting these battles. They're going to stay angry all the time. They're going to complain all the time. They're going to get bitter and resentful, and they're not going to accomplish what God has called them to do. It's very easy to understand that we war not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers and wickedness in high places. And we are in a war and we do need to fight, but we have to learn how to fight like a Christian. The only way that you can overcome evil is with good. You cannot fight evil with evil. You cannot fight anger with anger. The only way, understand me today, the only way, the only way to overcome evil is with good. God does not stop being good because the world is full of evil. Did you hear me? God does not stop being good because the world is evil. Now, we do have to fight a fight. We are in a war. The body of Christ is said to be an army, the army of God. And there's places in the Bible where we're referred to as soldiers in the army of God. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, Paul said to Timothy that he was to fight the good fight of faith. So, when you're being attacked, one of the ways to fight is just to stay in faith and to keep saying and keep saying and keep saying, God, no matter what's going on in my life, I trust you. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life to which you were summoned and for which you confessed the great confession of faith before many witnesses. So he's saying, don't just tell people, but fight that good fight of faith. Do you realize that when you've got a problem and instead of getting upset about it, you open your mouth and say, God, I trust you, that you're fighting like a Christian? Come on, let's say it again. When you have a problem, 
When you find out that somebody lied about you, when somebody didn't invite you to the party, when somebody rejected you, when somebody ignored you, those are minor things, let's go deeper. When somebody abuses you, when somebody misuses you, when you don't get the raise that you justly deserved at work, when somebody else gets the promotion that you should have had, anger is not the way to solve the problem. Now you're gonna feel anger. The first response is you're gonna feel anger, and I would too. But that's not my clue to just go ahead and get angry and have a fit. Just because I feel anger, what I need to do is say, uh-oh, the devil's trying to steal from me again. God, thank you for the fruit of self-control. By your grace and mercy, I'm gonna just calm down. Calm down. And if you have a hard time calming down, you need to try what we had here earlier when we were worshiping God and Jackie was singing that song about the Holy Spirit. Get yourself some good worship music and if you're on the verge of having a fit, turn it on, get in a room by yourself and just go. Oh. Okay, now Lord, I feel like, but thankfully I don't have to because I'm a new creature. So here's my response, and I would speak it out of my mouth. Here is my response to the attack against me. God, I trust you. I trust you. I will say of the Lord, Psalm 91, one and two. Verse two, I will say of the Lord, I will put my trust in him. He is my refuge. I will say of the Lord, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall remain stable and fixed under the shadow of the Almighty, whose power no foe can come against. If you don't want to be defeated by the devil, just hang out in the presence of God. Keep saying, God, I trust you. God, I trust you. God, I trust you. I need to stay another week and teach some of you how to talk out loud. And I mean to do something besides murmur about all your circumstances. And then I would follow that up by saying, now God, I've learned how to fight like a Christian. So I'm asking you to show me somebody that I can bless. Come on, I know this is new. Let's just go ahead and go through the gate this morning, okay? You're being attacked. Let's just make up a story. Pastor's been faithful, he's had an associate pastor, he's loved and blessed and he pays him well and he respects him and he honors him and the guy gets good vacation. And so the guy gets it in his head that he should have his own ministry. So instead of doing it right and going to the pastor and telling him what's in his heart and asking him to help him and how's the right way to go about this, he begins to cause dissension by finding things wrong with the pastor and talking about the pastor among the other people that he knows in the congregation. I don't know, you know, a pastor seems to me like he's kind of losing his anointing. And did you see that new car he bought? I bet, he, you know, I'm not giving my money for him to drive some big fancy car. And did you see that jewelry his wife wears? I mean, that, that's a little much, don't you think? And you know, their kids are quite unruly. I mean, they don't make their kids mind at all. So he stirs up enough other stupid people, excuse me, but that's what they are. It's bad enough for somebody to do that, but it, 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 we're just as dumb as they are if we listen to them. When somebody comes to you finding fault with somebody, especially somebody that you have loved and admired that's working hard to help you, you need to come back with, well, you know, I don't know about that, but I do know that they've helped me a lot. My life has changed. They're faithful, they're dedicated, they're diligent. Listen to me, it's a trap. It's a demonic trap. Offense comes from a Greek word called scandalon, which means the bait 
that was hung on a trap that lured an animal into the trap for destruction. So when the devil stirs up strife and tries to get us offended, he's baiting us. John Bevere wrote a great book called The Bait of Satan, and literally, offense and strife is the bait of Satan to lure us into a life that's going to have no power, no victory. We're going to miss the call on our life. We're going to miss what God wants us to do and what he has for us. Okay, so associate pastor gathers up a few not so wise people and the more they talk, the madder they get, the more they find wrong. And so they decide that they're just going to leave and go start their own church. And I can tell you there's very few churches that this hasn't happened in. It's called church splits. And so now let's just say the congregation is about 400 people and he takes 100 of them and goes a mile down the street and starts his own church. Now, pastor has a decision to make. Is he going to get mad? Is he going to lose his peace? Is he going to get angry? Is he going to start worrying and being afraid that, oh, he's losing his people and now he's going to go down the drain? First thing he needs to say is, well, God, we know that this is not being handled right and it hurts me and I think it's terrible, but I put my trust in you and anybody that leaves, you can give me three more in each person's place. Can I just tell you this? Anything that's not of God is not going to prosper. So we don't really have to worry about it too much. And then if he's really wise, what he should do is go buy the guy a sound system. Wow. Why would I want to do that? Because that's the way a Christian fights. That's the way you win your battles. That's the way you win your wars. Now, I know this is like a totally like sounds like crazy kind of thinking, but what do we think the Bible means when it says bless your enemies? Is that just a little floaty spiritual sounding? Oh, yes, bless your enemies. <laughs> There's too many things in the Bible that we never turn into practicality. We just sing about them and we confess them and we, we think they're cute little scriptures and we think somebody else ought to do it. But when it needs to be applied to our life, well, why would I want to bless my enemies? Nobody said you want to. What makes you think you have to want to to do it? Jesus didn't want to go to the cross. He made that plain, Father, if you can remove this cup from me, please do. However, your will be done and not mine. I don't have to feel like doing everything to do it. What if somebody would have showed up here this morning and said, oh, guys, sorry, Joyce didn't feel like coming today, so she just, she wanted to fly out early. <laughs> you don't have to feel like being friendly with somebody to be friendly. You don't have to feel like smiling at them to smile. And that pastor doesn't have to feel like buying that guy's sound system to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit if that's what God leads him to do. Is anybody seeing what I'm saying here about the power of being a blessing? Because what happens when he does that, when he trusts God and he does good, he puts himself right clearly in a position for a miracle from God. And that's what we need. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Verses 5 through 7. As for you, this is Paul's instruction to Timothy. But let's don't read it like it's just for Timothy. Let's take this in like it's for us. As for you, be calm and cool and steady. <laughs> calm and cool and steady. Accept and suffer. Uh-oh. unflinchingly <laughs> whoa you mean I can't even make a face <laughs> every hardship do the work of an evangelist fully perform all the duties 
of your ministry. So he doesn't get out of fulfilling his responsibility and his duty just because he's having a hardship. Hmm. Let's just say that you sign up to work in the nursery one Sunday a month at church and your Sunday rolls around and you didn't have a very good Saturday. It's a character test. What are you going to do? You're going to just not show up and not even tell anybody, which that's what a lot of Christians do. They sign up, but don't show up. Oh, nobody will miss me. I'm just one person. Or maybe you even do let somebody know that you're not coming, but the whole reason why you didn't come is because you're not in the humor. You don't want to. You had a bad day. Let me tell you something. The only time we grow spiritually is when we do what's right when it doesn't feel right. Come on. I mean, if I feel like doing it, that's no test. But man, if everything in me wants to tell you off and instead I pray for you, now I'm growing. If everything in me wants to bail on my commitment, but because I want to be a person of excellence and integrity, I go ahead and I ask God for the grace to do it anyway, and I do it with a smile on my face without complaining, now I'm growing. Come on, it's easy to say, if I said, how many of you want to grow in God? There would not be one hand in here that wouldn't go up. Everybody would lift their hand. Well, you're not going to grow without something that makes you grow. I can't get more muscle unless I lift a heavier weight. Amen? We have to stop being afraid of hard things. We have to stop backing down for the fight. We're going to read verse 5 again and then go through verse 7. As for you, be calm and cool and steady. Accept and suffer unflinchingly every hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fully perform all the duties of your ministry. For I am already about to be sacrificed. My life is about to be poured out as a drink offering. The time of my spirit's release from the body is at hand. And I will soon go free. Now watch this. I have fought the good, worthy, honorable, and noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Wow. 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 You see, I made a decision about 20 years ago that I was going to finish. I was reading John 17, came across verse 4. Where Jesus said, Father, glorify me now, for I have completed the work that you have given me to do. And I had a touch from God when I read that, and I began to weep and weep and weep. And I made a commitment to God right there. I'm going to finish my race. With your grace and your help, I want to stand before you and be able to say, I did all of what you wanted me to do. I didn't do 10% of it. I didn't do half of it. I didn't do 90% of it. I didn't quit somewhere along the way because it got hard. I didn't give up because I got old. I didn't quit because I wasn't being appreciated. I didn't quit because I was being attacked. I want to finish my race. And let me tell you something. I don't think anything is going to feel better than that. Make your mind up today that you're going to finish that you're going to learn how to fight the good fight of faith. You're going to learn how to fight like God would fight, fight like a Christian, and you're going to go all the way through to victory. <laughs> Nobody can make this decision for you. Nobody. I love that scripture. The Bible talks about warfare. It talks about weapons. We're soldiers, we're in the army of God, and we can't win our battles if we're angry. You can't even pray effectively if you're angry. The Bible says, when you pray, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them, let it go. You know these scriptures, don't you? 
But you know, if I had an open altar up here, maybe not so much now, but if I would have just got up here this morning and said, you know, I'd love to pray for everybody in here who's angry, bitter, resentful. You have some kind of unforgiveness in your heart. Just come on down. <laughs> come on, you're seeing the picture. What do you think we would have had? Well, I can't help how I feel. I know that. I agree. But you can control yourself and choose to do what's right no matter how you feel. Now, if you were here last night, you might be saying, well, aren't you kind of repeating yourself? Didn't you say this last night? Yes. You say, well, I came to hear something new today. Well, we'll get around to that, but right now, we got to make sure you're going to do the first thing you heard. <laughs> Ephesians 4, 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not offend or vex or sadden him by whom you were sealed, marked and branded as God's own and secured for the day of redemption of final deliverance through Christ from evil and the consequences of sin. Let all bitterness, now these go together. He's getting ready to tell us how we offend the Holy Spirit. Let all bitterness and indignation and wrath, passion, rage, bad temper, resentment, anger, animosity, quarreling, brawling, clamor, contention, slander, evil speaking, <laughs> abusive, blasphemous language be banished from you. Now, you know, if you really want to get stuff like this in you, you should take that scripture, write down each one of those words, and look each one of them up in a dictionary and see what they mean. Because, you know, we can just slide over this stuff. And what do we do instead? Here's the way to fight like a Christian. And become useful and helpful and kind to one another. Tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, loving-hearted, forgiving one another readily and freely as God in Christ forgave you. <laughs> See, we don't want to just stop doing the wrong thing. We want to start doing the right thing. And the thing is, is if I start doing the right thing, then when the devil comes back, there's no room for him because I'm not just an empty shell waiting for him to come and do the same thing to me today that he did yesterday. You have no idea how powerful it makes you if you make a decision that you're going to be a lover of people and you are going to be an on-purpose person who doesn't wait to feel like being a blessing to somebody, but you do it on purpose. I wonder how many people sitting in this room made a plan this morning to do something good for somebody today. Now, you actually thought it through. I got my plan. I've already got a target picked out. When I get out of here, somebody on my team is getting a blessing. You know why? I think I've done some damage here today. And you know, I'm tired and I could think, well, I sure hope somebody blesses me. But I think I'm just going to go ahead and give the devil another black eye and just not do good in the pulpit, but just keep doing good. When we have a problem and we say to God, I trust you, that's when we're really starting to fight like a Christian. Because trusting God is the first step in bringing us peace. And you know, peace is very, very powerful. This community likes boys, so they want their boys to go to school first. 
The girls, they don't have any, any value when it comes to education for them. So if they can get some money for her and not have the burden of having to care for her, it helps the family. The flags that you see on the homes over my shoulder represent a long-standing tradition that is very difficult on girls. As soon as a very young girl reaches puberty and she's of childbearing years, you'll see these flags above their houses representing the fact that a young girl is available to a man, essentially on the market, up for sale. And at that point, her life changes dramatically. So what they do is they take him out of school and they'll actually go through different activities, teaching them how to cook, how to be a, a wife in the, in the home. But part of it is also how to please a man. And that's through, you know, normal things in the house, but also sexually. So they teach them different things about sexuality and so on. So we are doing anything that we can to help people understand the value of girls. That's the key. And helping these girls by taking them into a program <laughs> called Imagine Hope. Because it's that small. If they would live with us for six months and we would have devotions, lead them to the Lord, really mentor them in how to be a godly woman, and then at the same time teach them how to do some skills, basic things like jewelry making or whatever it is that they can have some kind of an income that they can bring to their families. This is a good hat. Were you afraid when you thought that you were going to have to be married? Some of my friends, they are already married now, but they are used to suffer in that marriage. So if myself, I was afraid to be married while I'm still young, but because of this program, my mom, she didn't take me to the marriage, but she bring me here so that I can proceed with my education, so that I can help her in future, change her situation. I, I'm so grateful. I wish I could bring everyone here and let them see the impact of what's happening. Um, and I'm grateful for it because we should give and we should give to those that we don't benefit us. And I think that's what Hand of Hope does and, and we're grateful for that. We are helping young women like this all over the world. Help us to guide, restore, and love young girls. Your designated gift today, if you choose, can go to Project Girl, or you can give toward water, you can give toward feeding, and do something that you know will make a difference. It's very painful and difficult to go through life with a wounded soul. I know because for years I lived that way due to being sexually abused by my father when I was a young child. But I learned that God could heal even my deepest hurts if I would just open my heart up and let him in. And in my new book called Healing the Soul of a Woman, you too can discover how to allow God into those wounded places in your life. God has a brand new beginning for you, and you do not have to spend the rest of your life hurting. Bestel nu innerlijke genezing van de vrouw via onze website joyce-meyer.nl of bel 026 20 22 100.